Star Trek has a long history that includes 13 films made over 37 years. And fans have spent hours debating which movies are best and worst. Is there a problem there? Yeah, there sure is, Spock. In fact, it's pretty normal to be surfing the web and come across a YouTube channel or website boasting a best Star Trek movies ranking list. But the one thing no one has thought to do is combine all of the data across blogs, social media sites, and within the fandom itself to find out definitively how all 13 Star Trek movies rank in order across media and the fandom. So buckle up and get ready to find out exactly how the world ranks Star Trek in 2023. And the results are surprising, so you don't want to miss this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so now. And give us a thumbs up if you want more inside knowledge about your favorite shows. And make sure you stay tuned to the end to see how to get this awesome Star Trek inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at MixTees.com. Resistance is futile. The task of trying to figure out how all Star Trek fans rank the franchise's movies was not easy. We've been compiling data for months, and we've included lists from more than 120 Star Trek movie ranking lists from around the world created in the past 12 months. We've also included survey information collected at multiple science fiction conventions from thousands of Star Trek fans who had a varying degree of opinions on the six original movies, four Next Generation movies, and the most recent three rebooted movies. We also developed a point system so you can see how close each of the movies were to each other in voting. Alongside the definitive ranking, you will also get to see how we rank the movies by combining scores from everyone on the podcast team. If you enjoy this list, make sure you check out our definitive ranking of Star Trek series right after this video. And make sure you stick around for a surprise before we get to our top three later in the episode. Before we show you the first definitive ranking of all Star Trek movies, let me quickly tell you why you're going to love this video sponsor sponsor, Cook Unity. Amuse your taste buds. Cook Unity is the first chef to you meal delivery service, made up of over 70 chefs who believe that great food should be for everyone. How entertaining is it to feel like you're eating in a different restaurant every night? Each week, award-winning chefs craft hundreds of globally inspired meals with over seven different dietary preference filters, including vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. Meals are delivered fresh, never frozen, and the menu rotates every week. So there's always a new restaurant quality meal to try. Chefs cook meals with real ingredients, nothing artificial, with humanely raised meat and organic ingredients whenever possible. Chefs focus on flavor and inventiveness while leaning into a wide range of different types of cuisines to bring you the best meals possible. Tonight I'm eating the grilled Asian hanger steak with charred broccolini by Chef Stacy Barang. I love Cook Unity because it would take me hours to create meals like this and they still wouldn't be as good as the chef's food I'm enjoying every night. The subscription is super flexible and you can pause, skip weeks, or cancel anytime. Go to cookunity.com slash popcast50 or click the link in the description and use my code popcast50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourselves. You'll be glad you did. Without further ado, here is the 2023 definitive list of ranked Star Trek movies. Number 13, Star Trek Nemesis. The fourth and last Next Generation movie took the bottom spot of all Star Trek films with 2,698 points. The 2002 movie chronicles the TNG crew on the Enterprise E as they investigate a mutiny on Romulus and learn that the Romulan commander they are facing off against is none other than Captain Picard's clone. Shinzon was played by a young Tom Hardy fresh off of Band of Brothers and Black Hawk Down. Interestingly, Jude Law was initially looked at for the role, but director Stuart Baird wanted an unknown in the part. The film was a box office failure, only earning $67 million worldwide against a $60 million budget, not including the limited marketing for the movie. Famed critic Roger Ebert said it gradually occurred to him during the movie that Star Trek was over and that it was just out of gas. LeVar Burton, who played Geordi LaForge, and Marita Sirtis, who played Deanna Troy, didn't have kind words to say about the director, criticizing him for not watching any episodes of The Next Generation. Jonathan Frakes, who played Commander Riker, said that if he had directed Nemesis, he would have made the film less villain-centric and given more screen time to the Next Generation cast. And we couldn't agree more with that comment. We did finally get the 
the wedding of Will and Deanna and the ultimate sacrifice by Data, but the poor performance of Nemesis, which was following a weak performance from the previous movie, Insurrection, put an end to the plans for a fifth TNG movie setting up the 2009 reboot film. Patrick Stewart would later describe Nemesis as a pretty weak finale for the next generation, but thankfully we would eventually get a proper ending 20 years later with Picard Season 3. Shout out to showrunner Terry Metalis. Star Trek Nemesis sits at number 13 on our all-time rank list as well. Goodbye. 10, 9, 8, 7. Number 12, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. The only Star Trek film directed by the legend William Shatner, James T. Kirk himself, earned 3,749 points among fans to claim the second to last spot on the definitive list. The 1989 movie followed two successful movies directed by the other Star Trek legend, Leonard Nimoy, who was not interested in directing a third Star Trek movie in a row while also pulling double duty as Spock. As it turns out, all of the creatives were pooped out after Star Trek IV, so Shatner stepped up. It's off often reported that Shatner strong-armed his way into the director's chair and threatened not to be in Star Trek V if he wasn't allowed to direct. What is often left off is that Shatner had been promised he could direct the next film when he signed on for the voyage home following a pay dispute. And it was all thanks to a clause that Shatner and Nimoy's lawyers drafted up during the original series that essentially said whatever pay raises and future opportunities Shatner received, Nimoy also got, and vice versa. Since Nimoy had already directed two films, it was Shatner's turn. The problem was that other than directing a handful of TV episodes, Shatner had no real experience as a director, especially not with anything the scale of a Star Trek film. Based on Shatner's original screenplay, Star Trek The Final Frontier portrays the Enterprise A as some of the crew battles with Spock's half-brother Cybok as he sets out to seek the Vulcan heaven Shaka Ri. And yes, we were all shocked that Spock had a brother we never knew of before. Let me get this straight. You and Cybok have the same father different mothers. We can thank Star Trek movie producer Harv Bennett for this curveball in Star Trek canon. With all due respect, the Enterprise is a disaster. Creator Gene Roddenberry hated the idea of Sarek fathering a child before Spock, and Shatner hated the idea at first as well, but would end up liking it after Bennett mapped out the story. And as easy as it would be to criticize Bennett for this, he also gave us three awesome Star Trek movies before number five. Plus, he deserves mad respect for sitting down and watching all 79 episodes of Star Trek the original series before touching Star Trek. Wouldn't it be awesome if the people making Star Trek today poured themselves into the franchise like that? We'll talk more about Bennett when we get to Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. The original character of Cybok was named Czar and inspired by Shatner by television evangelists of the time. There's one, two, three. The Final Frontier was expected to be one of the summer's biggest movies and a sure hit. But despite being number one at the box office in its first week, the movie would end up earning only $63 million against a $33 million budget before marketing, ending up as the season's 10th best grossing film. Bennett blamed part of the film's failure on the change from a traditional Thanksgiving season Star Trek opening to the sequel-stuffed summer release period, which that year included movies like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, and Batman, among others. Critics were all over the spectrum on the movie, eventually ending up with likable but average. It was criticized for not knowing if it wanted to be humorous or serious, and that action sequences were weak and the special effects awful. The film was released just a few months before the vastly improved Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3 show began, which altered the public's perception of the TS crew as outdated. Despite the poor showing on the definitive worldwide list, we feel that despite being an overall mess, Star Trek The Final Frontier has 30 six minutes of incredible relationship building must see content between our beloved TOS characters and because of that it sits at number six on our all-time rank list. You must be one with the rock. Spock, I appreciate your concern but if you don't stop distracting me I'm liable to be one. Yes. Number 11, Star Trek Into Darkness. Sometimes you just can't help going back to the Khan Noonien Singh well. With 3,813 points, the sequel to the 2009 rebooted Star Trek movie made so many questionable moves, even John Harrington, or 
Khan couldn't save this movie from audience ire. Into Darkness takes a fresh look at the most popular villain from the original series, but ultimately ends up being a smorgasbord of twisted storylines taken from other Star Trek movies. The initial problem started with fans seeing the movie art and guessing that Benedict Cumberbatch was Khan to only have J.J. Abrams lie and say he wasn't. And while Cumberbatch is an awesome actor, it's well established that Khan is a non-white character as a Sikh and former ruler of much of Eurasia. However, Robert Orsai said he was uncomfortable demonizing anyone of color, particularly one of Middle East descent. Whether it's an excuse or a personal problem, who's to say? But the criticism continued when Alice Eve's character Carol Marcus gratuitously stripped down to her underwear during a scene. Nicholas Meyer, who directed Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, which many of the Into Darkness storylines were taken from, revealed in 2018 that he had been disappointed with the film. He said, if you're going to do an homage, you have to add something. You have to put another layer on it. And they just didn't. Just putting the same words in other characters' mouths didn't add anything. Perhaps if J.J. realized without Space Seed there is no relationship between Kirk and Khan, it might have been better. Oh, that's right. He never got Star Trek, did he? Growing up, I always thought it was, honestly, I couldn't get into it. My friends loved it. I was not really a fan. Well, honestly, we never got J.J. either. I stopped listening to you when you said you didn't like Star Trek. And as a result, Star Trek Into Darkness also sits at number 11 on our all-time rank list as well. My name is Khan. Number 10. The third foray into the Next Generation movie universe was the one that was most like an episode of the TV show. Star Trek Insurrection earned 3,979 points, and that's with a bath scene between Riker and Troy. Bridge to Riker. Can I get back to you, Mr. Worf? And yes, they were actually naked in that hot tub together, if you can believe their commentary. Oh, I remember this scene. One of my scene. favorite days in show business. Perhaps that's because Insurrection was directed by Jonathan Frakes, and as we all know, directors always get their way. The movie was largely a character piece focused on Data, with the Enterprise crew yet again breaking the Prime Directive while on an observation mission on the peaceful backwoods planet Baku. Written by Michael Pilar, the idea came from both Pilar and Star Trek head Rick Berman, who also happened to be working on Star Trek Voyager together. So no one should be surprised, since the script was coming off the second season of Star Trek Voyager, that the race of body part collecting Vidians would inspire the mummified death delaying Sona. After the intensity of Generations and First Contact, Insurrection comes across lighter in tone, with the crew having more fun. This led to the film feeling less consequential, albeit enjoyable. With lower stakes, word of mouth would also yield lower earnings at the box office. While still breaking $100 million, Insurrection would be a significant falloff from First Contact, despite having a similar budget. On an interesting note, Brent Spiner, who played Commander Data, requested to be killed off during Insurrection out of fear he would age out of the role. But the production team sent him back a note that simply said, kill you later which they did during Nemesis. But all in all, if we wanted to watch our TNG crew relocate a group of people, we'd just go back and watch episode 13 of season seven, titled Homeward. And because of that, Insurrection sits at number 12 on our all-time rank list. I have an odd craving for the blood of a live Kolar beast. This environment must be affecting me again. And have you noticed how your boobs have started to firm up? Number nine. Star Trek Generations. The movie that would bring the two most beloved Star Trek captains together for the first and only time received 4,187 points. Generations was a highly anticipated movie. TNG had wrapped up its series months earlier and fans who carried a torch for Kirk also had a new love in Picard. The anticipation of seeing them both on screen interacting with each other was enough to make any Star Trek fan giddy. And while we got one of the lines we wanted, don't let them do anything takes you off the bridge of that ship. The uninspired death of Captain Kirk had fans walking away from the movie, scratching their heads. After Spock's death and Wrath of Khan, certainly they could do better than this. Despite a lukewarm fan reception, the movie did earn $118 million worldwide and would be the catalyst to launch three more TNG movies. In Generations, Kirk is pulled into the time-defying Nexus, where Picard finds him and brings him back to help him stop Soren, played by the capable Malcolm McDowell. Generations should have been one of the biggest moments in Star Trek history by bringing the old and new crews together. 
but Ronald D. Moore would describe Generations as a project with several requirements, one in which was that the studio wanted the original cast to only appear in the first few minutes and Kirk only recurring at the end of the film. Thanks a lot, Paramount. Just stop! As a result, only Scotty and Chekhov show up with Kirk in the beginning of the film, as most of the original series actors felt the roles were too limited. The studio also wanted a Khan Noonien Singh like antagonist, but of course they did, and a humorous data plot. Oh, what could have been. But despite all that, just having Kirk and Picard together on screen, even for a short time, was a thing of dreams, and the Enterprise saucer section crash on Viridian 3 was epic. So as a result, Generation sits at number four on our all time rank list. I take it the odds are against us, and the situation is grim. You could say that. Number eight Star Trek The Motion Picture. If you ever want to gauge the popularity of Star Trek, you can easily do so with this movie, which earned 4,851 points. The hunger to see the original series crew back in action was so huge, when the motion picture premiered on December 7th, 1979 in only 857 theaters, it set a box office record for the highest opening weekend gross. It beat the three-day weekend gross set by Superman and the opening weekend gross set by Star Wars. Despite that incredible financial financial opening, it wasn't all good news for our legendary crew, who in this movie was dispatched to intercept a cloud of energy, which at its center is a vessel, which is not only a non-biological machine, but the old Voyager 6 Earth probe, now sentient and intent on finding its creator. The motion picture, following its Star Trek series roots, is more thought-provoking, like 1968's 2001 A Space Odyssey, but with this movie coming out only 18 months after the blockbuster high-energy space adventure Star Wars, worldwide audiences' tastes wanted more octane. As such, motion picture had been dubbed the slow motion picture. But what the movie lacks in action, it certainly makes up for in visuals and sound, providing us a strange and truly alien experience for both the crew and moviegoers. The motion picture would start out as a movie, switch to a TV series, and end up back on the screen as a film thanks to the success of Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The motion picture would also begin a long association with Jerry Goldsmith, scoring future Star Trek films and television as well, and you can't hear a Star Trek theme song after 1979 and not think of Goldsmith. Star Trek The Motion Picture sits at number nine on our all-time rank list. Mr. Scott, shall we give the Enterprise a proper shakedown? I would say it's time for that, sir. I Number seven, Star Trek Beyond. The most recent Star Trek movie earned 5,673 points. After the miss with Into Darkness, the clear mission for Beyond was to forget fan-pleasing and deliver a clear, brand-new Star Trek adventure focused on the characters we love. In this movie, directed by Justin Lin, who made a name directing Fast and Furious movies, the Enterprise is dispatched on a rescue, but it's actually an ambush lying in wait. The ship crashes and the crew is split up as they learn that the enemy who brought them down has a bone to pick with Starfleet and is planning an attack on Starbase Yorktown. The initial script attempt for Star Trek Beyond was to have the crew get back to the sense of exploration and wonder and the kind of optimistic sense of future that Star Trek has always had at its core. But according to Simon Pegg, who not only plays Mr. Scott, but helped rewrite the screenplay, the studio was worried about it being too Star Trek-y, and they asked Pegg to make it a Western, thriller, or heist movie, and then populate it with Star Trek characters so the new film was more inclusive to an audience that might be hesitant about a Star Trek film that was too much well, Star Trek. You kidding me, sir? Forget how stupid that sounds that you don't want to make a Star Trek movie very Star Trek-y. Beyond didn't lose money at the box office, earning nearly $350 million against a $185 million budget before marketing. Following Beyond, it was officially announced Star Trek IV would see Chris Pine's Kirk meeting his father, played by Chris Hemsworth, but that would never materialize. And now, seven years later, Star Trek IV is still in the works. But that is a story for another day. We enjoyed the back and forth of Spock and McCoy in this movie, but despite that, Star Trek Beyond sits at number 10 on our all-time rank list. Let's make some noise. Number six, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. For anyone old enough to remember, waiting to find out what happened to Spock on the Genesis planet was agonizing for this movie, which earned 6,508 points. We eagerly collected our Spock-branded calendars and glasses sold at Taco Bell, waiting on the cliffhanger reveal at the end of Wrath of Khan that Spock may somehow be alive. But let's be honest, 
It would have been hard for any Star Trek movie to follow up on that second film, and as a result, Star Trek III does feel like it spends a lot of time undoing the previous film's most memorable moment. Don't get me wrong, we all wanted Spock back, but it's hard to follow up Khan with a brigade of ornery Klingons, even if their leader is Christopher Lloyd. Yes, that Christopher Lloyd. Wait, Scott. It's me. This would also be the first of two Star Trek movies Leonard Nimoy would successfully direct. The film explores Spock's rebirth, with his Katra, or spirit, being held in Dr. McCoy. Kirk and crew needs to figure out how to get McCoy and Spock back to Vulcan to put his Katra back in his body. The idea for the Katra came up when Nimoy was talking about the episode of Muck Time from the original series, and that there was a high level of spiritual transference among Vulcans. Thanks to a little mind meld with bones at the end of Khan, they had an excellent way of bringing our old Spock back. Star Trek III The Search for Spock sits at number 7 on our all-time rank list. I have been, and ever shall be, your friend. Number 5. Star Trek 2009 Earning 11,718 points, the rebooted Star Trek movie of 2009 brought Star Trek to the forefront of pop culture for the first time since Jerry Ryan showed up in her fitted uniform on Voyager in 1997. I see the way your pupils dilate when you look at my body. Paramount wanted its billion dollar movie and they pulled out all the stops to make it happen. They hired one of the hottest directors in the industry at the time in J.J. Abrams and managed to cast up-and-coming A-list actors. Throw in an alternate timeline mixed with a little Leonard Nimoy, a pissed-off Romulan, and Chris Pine who somehow embodies Captain Kirk and you have a recipe for success. Star Trek 2009 wouldn't make a billion dollars, but at nearly 400 million it was a box office success nonetheless. Heck, it even won an Academy Award with four nominations, something no other Star Trek film had done before. It was a strong casting for an alternate timeline Star Trek movie featuring new actors. They had good chemistry and they even included the original Spock as well. And while many critics and fans raved about how good the movie was, Roger Ebert probably summed it up best when he stated that the Gene Roddenberry years had stories with questions of science, ideals, and philosophy, but this movie has reduced Star Trek to loud and colorful action. Ebert gave the film two and a half stars out of four. Regardless, Star Trek 2009 would go on to spawn two additional movies, and some fans love the new actor so much they are eagerly waiting a fourth film. Star Trek 2009 sits at number 5 on our all-time rank list as the most rewatchable of all the Star Trek rebooted movies. Buckle up. Number 4, Star Trek 6: The Undiscovered Country. Art imitates life in this movie that earned 12,683 points. The Undiscovered Country was born out of a suggestion from Leonard Nimoy to writer-director Nicholas Meyer. He wondered what would happen if the wall came down in space. Of course, referring to the Berlin Wall, which came down on November 9, 1989, the West and East entered a time of glasnost, or openness. What would that look like between Klingons and the Federation? Star Trek VI would give us one of the best villains since Ricardo Mon Montalban played Khan. Christopher Plummer played the raging, Shakespeare-quoting Klingon General Chang, a maniacal Ahab, and the whale is Kirk. The commercial disappointment of Star Trek V The Final Frontier had the studio planning for a prequel with younger actors portraying the crew of the Enterprise while attending Starfleet Academy. But thanks to negative reaction from the original cast and the fans, the idea was dropped and the task was given to Meyer, who was told by the studio to produce a movie that wouldn't cost a lot in time for the 25th anniversary of the franchise in 1991. Gene Roddenberry was ill, but he still wielded significant influence, and he hated Meyer's script. He hated that the characters were shown as bigoted and flawed, and he protested the villainization of Savick. But despite the creator's feelings about the script, the studio moved forward in early 1991 with a plan for the movie to premiere before the end of the year. Gene wouldn't make it to the airing as he passed away 43 days before the movie made it to the big screen. But according to the film's producer, Gene screened the near final version of the movie and approved it. Opposing that idea was both Nimoy and Shatner's memoirs, which report that after the screening, Gene called his lawyer and demanded a quarter of the scenes be cut. Whatever the truth, the sixth Star Trek movie would be deemed a success, earning nearly $100 million worldwide and cementing the idea that even numbered Star Trek movies were successful. The Undiscovered Country sits at number eight on our all time rank list, mostly for the same reasons Roddenberry didn't like the film. Fire! To be. 
or not to be. Honorable mention, Galaxy Quest. Although not officially a Star Trek movie, it wouldn't exist without it. Our honorable mention for best Star Trek movie is Galaxy Quest, the 1999 science fiction comedy that explores what would happen if your favorite historical science fiction TV show were mistaken by aliens as real space adventurers. Anchored by acting icons Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, and Alan Rickman, among others, Galaxy Quest was made as a love letter to Star Trek fans. In fact, fans loved the movie so much, they were asked to rank it among other Star Trek films at the 2013 Star Trek convention convention in Las Vegas. It turns out fans loved Galaxy Quest 7th among the current 12 movies, a little less than Star Trek 2009, and a little more than Star Trek Generations. If we had to slide Galaxy Quest onto our list, it would actually come in at number 4, we love it so much. If you're interested in exactly why Galaxy Quest is so important to Star Trek fans, you can check out our definitive history of Galaxy Quest here at the end of this video. <laughs> Okie doke. Number 3. Star Trek First Contact the Next Generation's favorite fan movie tops out here on the list with 12,845 points. After the release of Generations, Paramount tasked Brandon Braga and Ronald D. Moore with developing the next film in the series. First Contact would feature the Borg, as they travel back in time to the 21st century to take out humanity before it developed into the Federation. The Enterprise and her crew would have to follow them back in time and stop them before they changed history forever. The first movie with no original series characters, the weight of success or failure would fall to Captain Picard and the characters of the next generation. When Ridley Scott and John McTiernan passed on the eighth installment, cast member Jonathan Frakes was chosen to direct and make sure the task fell to someone who understood Star Trek, much as it had before with Leonard Nimoy and Kirk when they directed. Frakes had directed eight episodes of Next Gen, and the project was in good hands despite it being his first feature-length movie. After changing historical time frames from the Renaissance to the moment Cochrane successfully tests his warp drive engine, the studio had a problem with the Borg. While the writers tried to keep the mindless hive as the Borg had been created, Paramount head Jonathan Dalgen felt the script was not dramatic enough and suggested an individual Borg to give the characters a villain to interact with. Star Trek First Contact was almost Star Trek Resurrection until the fourth Alien film was announced as Alien Resurrection. The second TNG film would end up earning nearly $150 million at the worldwide box office, helping to assure future movies would be made by the crew. Star Trek First Contact also sits at number three on our all-time list, and resistance to that idea is futile. See what I did there? No! No! Number two, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. The one with whales, as most non-Star Trek fans would call it, earned 14,537 points. The second Star Trek movie directed by Leonard Nimoy, The Voyage Home completes a trilogy that started with The Wrath of Khan, followed by The Search for Spock. In this fourth installment, intent on returning home to Earth to face trial for their actions in the previous film, the former crew of the Enterprise find the planet in danger from an alien probe attempting to contact now extinct humpback whales. The crew must travel to Earth's past to find whales who can answer the probe's call. And of course, what time is more perfect than Earth in 1986, where a Save the Whales campaign helped institute a ban that made commercial whaling illegal worldwide? In Nimoy's second film, Paramount told him they wanted his vision, despite having him under constraints for Star Trek III. Nimoy's vision was to have a lighter movie that didn't have a clear-cut villain, and after reading a book on extinct animals, as well as talking to a friend, humpback whales entered the Star Trek universe. Also interesting to note was comedian Eddie Murphy, a Star Trek fan, wanted a starring role. But Murphy didn't like the part they made for him, so he chose to make The Golden Child instead. The film's fish-out-of-water comedy and acting were applauded by critics, and the movie ended Crocodile Dundee's eight-week reign at the American box office, eventually grossing $133 million globally. If you were wondering if those humpback whales were real, few in the film were. Industrial Light and Magic devised full-size animatronics and small motorized models to stand in for the real creatures. The film was dedicated to the crew of Space Shuttle Challenger, which broke up 73 seconds after takeoff on the morning of January 28, 1986. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home sits at number two on our all-time rank list, and if you don't agree with that, well then... Double dumbass on you! Number one, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. 
nothing says cinematic masterpiece quite like 18,896 points. The Wrath of Khan blew away every other Star Trek movie at the top of the list, and it wasn't even close. 82% of every poll, blog, and news list we included had this movie at the top of their list, and who can blame them? Following the lackluster critical response of the motion picture, series creator Gene Roddenberry was forced out of the production of the next movie. New executive producer Harv Bennett wrote the film's original outline and would go on to produce the next three Star Trek films as well. Nicholas Meyer was brought in to complete the script, and he did so in 12 days. Meyer would go on to write the screenplays for The Voyage Home and The Undiscovered Country. As director of both Star Trek II and VI, Meyer is largely responsible for three of the top four movies on this list, and as such, in our humble opinion, should be recognized as a Star Trek legend in his own right. The Wrath of Khan is a sequel to the popular original series episode Space Seed, where Kirk and his crew stop a group of superhumans led by Khan Noonien Singh from taking over the Enterprise. In staying with Starfleet ideals, Kirk leaves Khan and his people on SETI Alpha 5 to start a colony. During the events of the Wrath of Khan 15 years later, SETI Alpha 5 has been turned into a mostly lifeless planet, and Khan wants revenge on Kirk for leaving them there to die. The movie was almost titled The Vengeance of Khan, but it was deemed too close to that popular Star Wars title, Revenge of the Jedi. Of course, it would end up being Return of the Jedi, but Wrath of Khan would remain. While no one thought to ask if Ricardo Montalban would have a problem making the movie because of Fantasy Island, it would turn out to not be a problem. In fact, Montalban was so excited about reprising his role that he played it for much less than was offered him, and he counted that role as a career highlight. His only complaint was that he never got to do a scene face-to-face -face with William Shatner. The movie would go on to make $97 million worldwide and give Paramount the confidence to continue making Star Trek in the future. Gene Siskel gave the film three and a half stars out of four, calling it a flat-out winner. And we agree, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan also sits at number one on our all-time list. Well, there you have it. The definitive ranking of Star Trek movies based on all available online and fan data in 2023. You can see how close it was between the different movies. Star Trek's two and four clearly dominated the top of the list with a close race for the next three spots. Also, there was only a thousand point difference between the eighth and 11th spots. And for a look at our overall movie ranking list, you can see that here. As you can see, we didn't align with the status quo in the middle and perhaps your list doesn't either. Of course, that's what's great about Star Trek. Everyone's opinion counts. And what is your opinion? Does this list match up with yours, or is it different? Share the order of your favorite movies in the comments below, and let's discuss it. Also, don't forget to take a peek at our merch store. Always great Star Trek and other pop culture gear you'll love. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. Until next time... Second star to the right. And straight on till morning.